Thanks, Tom. Yeah, it's interesting, you know, if you live a long time and you, you get to see your students go out and do interesting things. And I was also on Boss's PhD committee. I, I wasn't a supervisor, but we examined him. And I stumped him on my first question. He was really stunned by it, but uh, his work was really, really good. It's an excellent PhD thesis. So I have some links. And Gerard and I have done a couple times teaching in Spain. So I was very happy that Gerard made the suggestion that I could come here as a guest researcher when I retired from the University of Tevantum. Uh, just quickly, so you know where to find me, somewhere here. So if you, if you want to see all my things, you just go to my Cornell page. You can easily find that. And you'll see the various things I've been working on in my publications. And the real incentive is if you, if you go here and you click on the picture, you get a different picture every time. You get a different quote. So you, know, you can really spend some time there. And, <laughs> And you can try to f psychoanalyze me by the types of quotes I, I put up there. So anyway, that's kind of fun. And that's where some of the soil databases. OK, so I was asked to give a guest lecture. And let me get into this. Uh, 10 years ago, it's now actually 11 years ago, I wrote a paper for Soil Use and Management, which is a good journal I like very much. It's from the British uh, Society, Soil Science Society. It's a companion journal to European Journal of Soil Science. But it deals with more practical uh, applications or things that maybe the practicing soil scientist will want to look. So I, I wrote a paper on that with the same title about, at that time, what digital soil information could you get? So I decided for the conference in, in Nanjing last year that we had a digital soil mapping conference, I decided to update that. And that's where this came from. But of course, the past decade, or now 11 years, there's been just massive changes in technology and the question is you know a lot of this has happened but what has happened with soil data what has soil data kept up with this we all know about the massive changes in the last 10 years in our lives so the question is what has changed what is not what can we expect in the next few years and how can you participate because after all you're here you're obviously very uh, very motivated people to come all the way to Wageningen even though they very nicely put the Spring school in really beautiful, some of the best weather, really beautiful, typical Holland weather. So it's easy. If they put the school in January, I'm not so sure what kind of response you would get. But uh, anyway. OK, let's talk first. I have quite a few different things. One, I wanted to talk about the different forms in which soils metadata, metadata might come. And I'll show a few examples. One would be the ideal is a freely downloadable GIS coverage that you can get, put into your own project, and work with. That's the ideal. And I put a double question mark here. It's not useful at all if you don't have proper metadata. If you don't, you can have the coverage. It's sitting there. You don't know anything about it. You don't know what coordinate reference system it's in. You don't know what the attributes mean. You have a, a table with all these numbers. You don't know the type of lab analyses that were done or who collected the data. So this is fine, but you have to make sure that there's proper metadata so you know what you're dealing with as you try to use it. So that's the ideal. This number two is becoming less and less important. Some places you can get the data. They won't put it online. They will send you a DVD, maybe just for the small cost, just for reproducing the DP DVD. Nowadays, it's, this is much and much less, almost all, is because of the capacity of the networks like that. But this would be the same type of information. Number three is that you can't get it. You've got GIS coverages, but you can't get them unless you have a license. You have to pay some money, and you have to get a license. And I'll show an example there, too. One thing I want to emphasize there, if you get into using this data, you have to be very careful I would say that you get a perpetual license. That is, even if I pay money, I can now use this data for the purposes that I have stated for as long as I want. Some institutes, in particular the British, have a time-limited license. It's like a lot of software that you can, like uh, SAS, uh, statistical software, you have to pay a license every year. If you don't, you're out of luck. So you may have bought the data, you have made a derived product from the data, and all of a sudden, until you keep paying your ransom, you can't do it. So I would never, ever get data from a time-limited license. Possibly if I had a consulting job that I had to deliver then a map and just leave it at that, but it's not so useful. So 
you, you have to be very careful of the terms of license. Another form is something that's viewable and printable online. I mean, you can see it on the screen. I'll show an example of this. You can see it, but you can't get it into your GIS project. So it means that you could uh, look at it, you could learn things, but you couldn't then integrate it with your own data. Finally, our non-geo-referenced uh, scan maps as images. So sometimes you'll have the report that with it, and i explain this project in a little bit, and I'll talk about what we can do with that. Well, let's start with something to give Tom all the credit, he and he deserves it very well. Uh, a good example of online viewable and then downloadable, of course, is the Soil Grids project. Here I've picked a 10 by 10 area, degree area, very uh, warm to my heart because I used to live in Venezuela. Um, he's got it as a tile system, you can see the different layers. So you can play around with soil grids and you can see it online, you can consult it online, but then you'll also see a tab somewhere here for download. Tom, I don't know where I see that. Up at FP Access so you can get it. It's also very well documented so you know exactly what you've got, whether you like it or you don't like it, you know what's there, right? So this is really the ideal situation. Uh, you can then use it. Here's a little bit different situation. What I have here is a project I've been working on in India. And the background here, uh, in the, it's a little bit transparent. These, it's a scanned soil map. I'll explain in a minute how I could register that. But this is a piece of paper. Uh, that we have the map as a big piece of paper. We scan it and we can geo-reference it and bring it into the GIS. The problem is I, I, I don't have any spatial data unless I digitize. I'd have to now go and, and digitize all these lines if I would want to use that. And in some cases you could do it. But I was able in this case, and you might be able to do this even if you have a paper map, if you can get it properly geo-referenced, I'll explain the steps in the next slide, you can overlay it with other coverages. And here I have uh, the boundaries of the states and the, di and the districts within the state. This is in Jharkhand in India. I also have, uh, and those are these here, cities and any, anything else that you might, that other GIS coverages you could now integrate it. At least I can now go to an area and see what the soil is there by looking at the map. So if you have this, it's a bit of a project. I'll just briefly mention what you do. It sounds easy, but uh, there's a lot of tricks here. You scan the paper map at high quality. Make sure you use a flatbed scanner so there's no distortion as good a paper copy as possible. Now you have to find tick marks for coordinates and I'll show an example on the next slide. If you can't find any coordinates, you have another step. What you'll have to do is find well-defined locations such as road crossings and make sure they haven't moved. I still remember with Tom, I still remember once we were doing this, Tom did this with his maps in Croatia years ago and we came to this, this, this place that looked very good on the map but the Croatians had actually the road used to go like this, and they built a nice little cutoff like this. So we were off by, you know, 1,800 meters, but then we could realize it and fix it. But the, in other words, the map condition was not the same as the, as the soil map condition. Anyway, um, this is a major step, discovering the co coordinate reference system. You're hoping that it's on the map. There's an extremely nice uh, set of columns called the Grids and Datums, which is from the Photogrammetric Engineering and Remote Sensing Journal. This guy, Cliff, Cliff Mounier, has been working for years on this, and most of your countries, you'll find a whole history of the mapping and the geodetic systems that were used. Very interesting uh, column, and you'll go to countries with, you know, colonial history and then different projects and so forth, and you might help you figure out what your map is in. When you do, you have this registry of all the coordinate systems in the world. So this is, this is tricky, but it's not hard once you get the hang of it. And the software is there to do all these conversions, so you're all right. So then you open the scan of the GIS, you digitize the tick marks, and you register it. You transform it to your GIS, and finally, you can then transform it to any coordinate system. So if you have a paper map, you can at least get it so it's fitting in the rest of your GIS project, even though we don't unless you would then digitize the lines, you don't have that. And here's an example of what I did in a case in Kenya. I know we have one Kenyan here. This took me a little while to uh, figure out what was going on, but you see this got this very obscure coordinate reference system. A war system, East African war system, special transverse mercator 
on ARC 1950 datum, and um, it took me a while to figure this out, but you see here is, here is the tick mark, and you can't see too well in the here, but you can find the tick marks in here so I could then do it. Uh, fortunately, this was turned out to be a very high quality. Oh, I got this from the ISRIC library, by the way. Uh, this was now six or seven years ago. And here, after I co converted it to WGS84, I could drape it on top of the SRTM. Uh, DEM and it looked really really nice here we have the the river coming here and it's a little hard to see we have these hills with a little iron stone on top and so this is an ideal situation sometimes when you do this you'll be very disappointed in the results but here whoever the surveyors really had a very excellent job and all I had to do was get the, the it done correctly so this is not yet a GIS coverage I, I should say it would be in the GIS we can look at it we can consult it but we, we, we don't have a, you know, a database with it. Okay, one thing I wanted to mention, this is becoming more and more common, is be able to get dynamic maps into your GIS that you don't have yourself, uh, they're being held on a server for you that you can then use. And there are quite a few acronyms here. What I mainly want to show here, the difference is, with some, you have with these two, the features and the coverages, you can get it onto your computer and actually have it. And the other, it will just display as a TIFF and you don't really have the data. They'll only sort of show it to you and you'll see it in your GIS, but you don't have it as a coverage. So that's a technical, Tom will, knows more about that than I do. Here's an example from the British. I like to beat up on the British, you know, sometimes. They're very, very, since Margaret Thatcher came in, they dismantled their soil survey. Uh, they have, the soil scientists there haven't been able to convince the people of the value. Uh, and they just try to make money with it. And here we have a case where we can go and see on a one kilometer grid. Uh, this is a, a parent material map with certain soil properties. So here we have the European Soil Bureau classification. I, I can click on a location and I can see something about it. But I, I can't get this into my GIS. I can only show it. I could put other coverages on top of this. I could, I could put roads and other anything I might have on t my own observations on top of it, but it's not really in my map. It's just served as a web map service. So in this sense, it's very much like a scanned image that I would scan myself and do like that. Let's talk about commercial products since we're here in the Netherlands. Uh, they've made a, a, very, a decision, and later on I'll talk about business models. And I think they made a big mistake in their business model, but this is their model, not mine. If you would like to get the Dutch soil survey map, which has been paid for multiple times by the taxpayers, it's going to cost you $550 just to get in, uh, euros just to get in the door. That's just your entry price. And then you have to negotiate. <laughs> and you have to pay two euros 90 per square kilometer. Uh, and they don't even tell you they're leaving the cities out, so you'll have blank areas. I think they don't count the blank areas, so at least you don't have to pay for those. If you want to get uh, 250, this one really amazed me. You want to get the, the country at 250,000 scale, you have to pay 10,000 euros flat. That's a lot of money. At least you get, hey, <laughs> I've exceeded my storage. That's it. <laughs> It's so bad, it's so bad with the point observations that the price is on request. So it's like sticker shock, you know, you, they don't want to shock you too much online. So. so this is a commercial product. The only thing I will say good about this is that um, it is a perpetual license. So if I'm a consultant uh, and I get this data, I'm, I'm then free to use it. I can't resell it or something like that, but I can use it in all my products uh, and it's very well documented. So uh, where am I here? Now it's not going anywhere. There we go. Where am I here? Okay. Let's get a little technical, sort of GIS technical here for a minute. And we'll talk about the different kinds of spatial entities that you might have in your map. So if we get a GIS coverage, what, what can we have as spatial entities? First is points. Uh, conceptually, they're, they're zero dimensional, but of course they have a real support in the field. But at the scale we show them on the map, we consider them just a point. So these are point observations. Uh, they'll show you the location of the observation. And they'll show you some linked attributes. So whatever, and it might be quite a complicated database. You might have attributes for every horizon or by layer. You have chemical attributes and f attributes in the field and so forth. 
you've heard about grids uh, quite a bit from uh, in the GCF course, of course, and in the other course this morning from George. So the idea of the grid is you take the whole space and you divide it up into small pieces and you then say something about each of those regular pieces. And the technical word there is tessellation. Uh, these could be, there are two ways you, you might have this. One might be that the different grids are produced independently. And an example there that I like is if you have now point observations with heavy metal concentrations or some kind of concentration of an element, you independently analyze that geostatistically, you independently make an interpolated map. So the maps are all on the same grid basis, but the maps are made independently. So they're, they're separate maps. Another way is you have some linked attribute database, and I call this a fake grid, and I'll explain why in the next slide. That is, each grid cell is linked to a database with many attributes, and they weren't all interpolated on their individual basis. Somehow they were assigned, but every grid cell with the same identification has the same, uh, has the same values. OK, I'll show that in the next slide, I think, one or two. Polygons, all right. A polygon is an area we delineate on a map, and inside we say it's homogeneous. I put that in quotes. Because I'm not saying that we're not implying that everywhere in there is the same. It's just from the database's point of view, every location in there is the same. So we, we may even make some statements in there that uh, within the polygon there may be different things, but we don't locate them. So everywhere in that polygon, doesn't matter if it's right on the edge or right in the middle of the polygon, it's considered to be uh, the same. And this will almost always be linked to an attribute database, a relational database. Uh, when is a grid not a grid? This is what I mean by fake grid. So what the Americans did, uh, they have this, this polygon product they call Surgo, which is their state soil survey database. Scales originally from about 12,000 to 24,000, depending on, on the original survey. So this is, a, this is actually from their brochure. This is a concept of a polygon map. So the idea that would be everywhere in here, uh, the attributes of the soil would be the same. They'd be one database entry. It doesn't matter if I click here, here, or here, I'd get the same thing. And all they did was just split it up into a 30 meter grid and do it like that. So you have, you've gained absolutely nothing. In fact, you've lost because you no longer have the precise boundary. You've, you've actually coarsened your boundary. So they, they're very proud of this. They say, I have a gridded product. So what? I mean, <laughs> you know. The only thing is, the reason they did this is, of course, a lot of models, environmental models, run on a gridded basis. This is one of the main reasons, I think, behind soil grids, uh, soil grids approach. Uh, an environmental modeler says, OK, at a certain resolution, I want to know the water holding capacity or the organic matter because I'll use that in my, in my model. So that's why we like a grid. It makes sense if we're interpolating to each grid cell separately, but something like this doesn't make any sense at all. But they're very proud of it. They claim, oh, now we have, we've met these global soil map specifications by doing this. But anyway, OK. Now, a little bit of a complication here with the spatial entities are what we call map units. And this is what you'll see in a conventional soil map. Groups of polygons, they can be different places on the map. They're all linked to one legend entry. This is your classical soil map, which I'll show in a minute. Interesting here is it is possible that some of these may be what we could call compound map units. That is, the map unit, which has multiple polygons, is in the database listed as having more than one constituent, more than one type of soil. The problem is we don't know where it is, but at least it's telling us that, and sometimes with a proportion, what we have there. Uh, they'll be unmapped. The surveyor typically knows where they are. Now, I'm going to show later on an example of what I call this disaggregation. If there is some indication in the database of the landscape position of the different components, so maybe there's a large map unit at a certain scale that we can't show the detail, but we do know that 10% of the area are you know, low-lying relic potholes from, uh, from the glace ice time, and we can say on the landscape where they are, then that information should be enough later to use several methods to do what we call disaggregation, which I'll show in a minute. So this, it is possible sometimes nowadays to take these compound map units and, and uh, break them down further. 
All right, what type of information can we have? Of course, we may have uh, soil types and some classification system. Uh, yesterday, or Wednesday, those of us were on the excursion. I hope you didn't find it too boring when we were arguing about the classification, but this is something we love to do. One of our favorite activities is arguing about classification <laughs> in the field. But I, I, the point is, uh, this does, the idea of soil classification is essentially that uh, you don't worry about the technical details so much as to realize that when we look at, when a soil geographer looks at the universe of soils, the attribute space is not uniformly filled. There are definite clusters that we recognize almost with a personality. Uh, that's what I'd call it. And, and that's our, our mental model or a central concept of a soil type. That's why I use this word personality. And these can be used to communicate with the land users uh, where you say, you know, this soil has these capabilities, these, these, these limitations, these problems. The types can be quite useful that way, despite all the arguments about the classification. Okay, another thing we might see are what I'm calling static soil properties. Now, static is a relative term because as we've heard for the land degradation, you know, soils are changing, soils can change. But certain things, uh, you know, the subsoil bulk density probably won't change very fast. That would be pretty unusual. Certain properties don't change very fast, so you'll have maps of this kind of information. Some of those may be by hori per horizon, which is a genetic horizon, or maybe just described by layer. Um, others might be just one value for a location, because we're not going to look at the vertical dimension. Something that we don't do very much of, we want to do more of in the future, are dynamic soil properties. Uh, soil moisture and temperature. They have put up a, just recently a new satellite, the SMAP satellite, that's going global soil moisture. There have been a lot of experiments with this before. So it's going to be possible now to say, well, I'll have a map that's not talking about uh, a static property, but it's dynamic. It's dynamic over time, and I have a time series. We're already quite used to this with our time series of vegetation indices, for, for example. Uh, and we're hoping to get more of these things. And the final thing we might have for soil information, which for those of you who aren't maybe soils um, more the, on the use side, if we can have a map of interpretation. So there's a split between the people that say, give me the raw data, I'll make my own interpretation. And the people that say, I'm not comfortable with that because I'm, I'm, I'm not really sure how to interpret this data, so I'd like someone else to make the interpretation for me. And then I have a map I can directly use. You know, the workability or the, the value for taxation, other things like that. So these can all be uh, maps you might find, soil information you might find. All right, here's a soil type map, just a typical soil type. And you see we'll have different map units. The map unit here, uh, let's see if we can see one. That here we have some map units, and we have different polygons of the map units. Now, why do we have white areas on this map with no soil information? For two you didn't reasons. Pay for it. What? You did not pay for it. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> this was one that this is paper map that the taxpayer already paid for. So that's not the problem in this case. It's out of bank area. What? It's out of bank. This is the urban area. Although if you ever go here, it's not very urban. This is pretty pretty country, but anyway, they call it urban. Yeah, but what about this huge area over here? What's the problem? Do you mean? It's what? German. It's Germany. Uh, hey, he know though. You gave it away. We're not going to map. We're not going to map the Germans. So we let the we let the Germans map their own. Yeah. No. So that that's that's understandable. But but in this case, they just left out any. Even though this is really not very urban area, it's not Glanerbruch. It's not very built up. There's a lot of soil there. But anyway. But this is a typical soil type map, and this is what it looks like when it becomes digitized. Again, you'll have to pay for this if you want this from the Dutch. But it's there. So they've, this is now available as a GIS coverage with polygons. And what's amazing here is that they recorded, they made a huge, I must say they took a lot of work to do this. These points are all the actual field borings that were made in the field. They're not all full profiles. What they are typically auger borings where certain things were recorded on, on little field sheets. How they got the exact locations of this, I'm not sure, because this was well before GPS. This survey was done, I think this one was the early 70s, I think, or late 60s, this far eastern Netherlands. This point here is the point between what used to be Prussia, Hanover, 
and the Netherlands. So it really was a three, before uni, Germany got unified. The first time, I should say. Anyway, but so the point is these are all, so if you would get these, that paper has been turned into this. Yeah, he knows it's Germany. Okay, let's talk about some of the people that might use the soil information and see where you can find yourself in this, in this story. Well, one might be the soil mappers themselves. They, they, they want to see how, how good a job they've done. They, they want to use this information to uh, help them make further maps to understand the soils and so forth. In the producing organization, the, in other words, the organization that makes the maps, there may be interpretation specialists. So someone in soil fertility makes the soil fertility capability map directly with the institution. So that's good. They have a very close link with the soil mapper. Other government departments responsible for various land use issues uh, who typically prefer interpretive maps. Uh, for example, for taxation, in, in Germany they have a system called the bonitas. It's a Latin word, but it means goodness in Latin. Somehow they used in German for this, this system, and they also use that in, I know in Ukraine, I'm not sure in Poland if you have that term, the bonitas. And they, they took the tame over from Germany. But anyway, and California has the story index, and these are used, so you'll, the map will now be interpreted. It will now be reclassified, and you'll have the information directly usable by the taxation department, for example. But so these, these kind of agencies might want to use soil information. Typically, they don't have anyone on staff who understands the soil maps well enough. So typically, what will happen is it's this second group that will make interpretations. And this was one of the major breakthroughs in the United States Soil Survey uh, in the 1960s. They decided to, they did a pilot project around in my home area in central New York State near Syracuse. And they f made all these interpretations for suburban uses, recreational uses, engineering uses. From, they still had the same soil maps, but they had specialists now that would interpret these maps that worked so well for the uh, town and country planners and for the general public that they then made those interpretations for the whole United States. And now when you get the American maps, you get not only the soil properties, but you get all these interpretations that you can directly use without really knowing. They'll tell you exactly why you shouldn't build a house there. They say, you know, this is because that's, or if you do build the house, you have to have a special foundation in the basement because the soils will shrink and swell and so forth. So the really good model is when these specialists work with these guys and, and make maps that can be directly used by the land use planners. If this, if this step is not done, that's one of the reasons that soil maps won't get used in a lot of countries. I've, I've been in people, they say it makes a beautiful wall display, but I don't know what to do with it. And that's maybe a fair criticism if, if it hasn't then yet been interpreted. Okay, soil mappers and other organizations, so for example, a consultant or a forestry surveyor or something might use these maps as a basis for their work. They might go further. Uh, land use specialists and other organizations, so for example, your consultant. Uh, now I mentioned here land managers. You might say, why did I put that far down the list? I don't really know why. But I'm now thinking of individual farmers or land managers. And these, uh, these people have to be trained to understand the soil maps. Again, if they're interpreted well enough, it's fairly easy, but you know, someone who studied soils and soil classification and soil properties in college, and that would be either the land manager or the consultant or the extensionist, then interprets the map and works with the actual land manager to help. Something we're very interested in, at, uh, Tom I was very interested in for sure, is working with the environmental modelers. There's so many models that are now being done at both global and local scale where soils are a really important part of the model. And a lot is not really known. We have a lot of progress on the energy balance and the hydrology, but some of these other things are not so well understood. But the soils data goes in these models. So these are another very important category of users of soil information. And I don't know what my client is doing here, Tom. And finally, we have, if you just like to get out in the country and. What's he doing here? If you just like to get out in the country and see what kind of soils you're going to come into and how hard it's going to be to walk and should you put on your rubber boots or not, will there be mosquitoes, you know, then that's, you know, we always use soil maps for that, so.
Now, now it won't go anywhere. Now it's going to do. Okay, so that's a little bit about you know, who the users might be, and I hope you found yourself either in, in that list or you're the one at a certain point in that list and providing information to others. Some of you have heard some of this already, so, uh, but these are the status. Now we're in the part of the status. Where are we, where are we today? And I'll talk about these, these different levels. Uh, and I have some examples of, of these. The world, and this is something you'll notice uh, IASA, the Systems Analysis Institute in Vienna was behind this. It's now moved to the FAO, and it's now being worked on at ISRIC as, as another product, which I didn't put here. Sorry, Niels. I think I prepared this before I knew you were working on that. And you know about the soil grids with Tom. I put Global Soil Map in gray because very little has come out of that project. It's supposed to be doing this whole world soil map, but we don't really have anything except in, in Australia to show for it. Regional, again, you see a couple of projects from ISRIC, uh, European Soil Database. National, you have some major countries that have full national coverages, but there are a lot that uh, don't. don't have. There are others. I haven't put everything. I mean, Germany and the Netherlands, for example, all of Europe, and then local. So let's look at some of the examples of what we have here. This is the Harmonized World Soil Database. And why is it not harmonized? <laughs> this is an area in China, in Nanjing area where I work, and the Chinese uh, provided, the Academy of Agricultural Science provided a very nice detailed map that can support the resolution of one kilometer. And you see all these soil types and it's all harmonized and everyone is happy and it's a very good map. Over here is my home area in upstate New York. This is the famous Finger Lakes. Uh, this is New York uh, and Pennsylvania. This is New York here and Pennsylvania here. And you have this extremely general coverage because the only thing they have is from the FAO soil map of the world at one to, I think it wasn't even five million back then. And these lines aren't even very accurate even where they are. So it's just a product that's hard, that's barely, barely usable. So although they have it, we depend on getting then better coverages for this from various countries. And ISRIC is good at negotiating this. And now that it's in ISRIC's hands to update it, I think some of these areas will become better. This is probably a very old view of soil grids one kilometer. Again, the Nanjing area and my home area. The difference here is Tom was using the harmonized soil database as sort of a background here, but then he's got more detailed predictions so that you can see that every kilometer square here is individually predicted. So uh, that's a, the soil grids has many properties. You've, you've seen that a lot. Now let's come to the national level. And this is an example of a, of a very good product. There's a lot of money that's gone into this, but I'll show a few uh, problems with it. This is the national, I should have said, the NRCS is the Nas Natural Resources Conservation Service of the United States of America, uh, which includes the soil survey. And what they've done is they've, over with a great big of effort, they took all their paper maps and re-digitized these. I was involved in this project some years ago, uh, and the maps were originally made on unrectified air photos, and it proved impossible to warp these in any automatic way. So what we had to do, the soil scientists in every state had to sit and by hand redraw the lines onto topographic maps. And so uh, that made that then geometrically correct. It was a huge amount of work. But probably you'd have to do the same thing if you had soil maps that are on unrectified photos that were just made on, say, field photos. You'd have to try to find the same things on a high quality topographic map in the United States, or maybe Google Earth, or Google Earth with the, with, the, uh, with the terrain might help a lot, actually. We didn't have that back in, in those days. Now, what's the problem with this map? Well, there are two problems with this map. One is, this area here was mapped 40 years ago, 4-0. How do I know that? How would I know this map has been done 40 years ago? Urbanization? No. Data. No. Oh, the metadata doesn't say, actually, it's a good question. The metadata in this does not say when, never says when the original survey was made. It, it tells when it's, 
digitized and so forth. You could go back and find the original county and soil survey report and you could find that, but it doesn't give it in the metadata. Something. No. It was part of your field work or something. Thank you. I made the map. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I made the map, dodging, dodging big black snakes all through here, but uh, this is in North Carolina in the United States. Uh, so that's how I know it's 40 years ago. The other problem was uh, I made the map, so you can either trust me or not, as the case may be. <laughs> and then somebody else, not me, re-digitized this map because, um, although in this area there's not a lot of relief. But there's a serious point here. This is a river, the Tar River. This is a bluff, this is a little higher land, this is a river, and you can see the pattern where the river has obviously been migrating in this direction. You see the alternate sandbars and, and, uh, and then back swamps. So the river has been migrating in this direction over the years. This is a very active river. So who's to say that 40 years later it's not moved farther? Further, some of these areas may have changed some of the farmers what they like to do is they have this, this topography that's like this, and what they sometimes do is take a big machine and take the sandy areas and knock them into the clayey areas and try to make a flatter area. So they, they, and, you know, they have big enough machines. So some of these fields, although I mapped them the way they were 40 years ago, may not at all be like this now. And this is a, something I wanted to mention because it's a, an issue with any map you get, it's unclear, often very unclear, what the status of that is. And even with soil grids, the point data that we used to make soil grids is over a how many a year period, 40, 50 year period, uh, which is the best you can do, but, and if you don't, if you take more recent ones, you won't have enough points. So it's, you have to be suspicious of these older maps, and sometimes, especially with the big floods or hurricanes, uh, let alone human intervention, the map may not be uh, correct. So, so anyway, but it's a good product. Detailed map. What? Sorry, sorry uh, Dave, but yeah. it is a very extremely detailed map, so at different scales, that may be a difference over time. Yeah, it, it, it may be less, less, less important at a difference of time at a more coarse scale, that's right. Uh, here is a, an example that's been done by a colleague of ours in the California Soil Resource Lab using the same information, and I'm showing this to show you how you can make a really nice product that's uh, much more useful for the, the, the useful for the user, or easy for the user to see. Here I've draped it on, the, he, he has it on Google Maps. So I've draped it on the terrain of Google Maps. You can put it on the, uh, also on the uh, satellite view of Google Maps. And so you can see, but now we have something else. So, so why do we think we have these, these, these straight boundaries between our soil types? counties. They are different counties. They were, even the legend is different. They were mapped at different times. And sometimes you see they had a difference of opinion. So they, they here this, this sort of just ends, just sort of out of nowhere. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and then other places, it's a little harder to see here, but there's some places where the map unit doesn't map, match the topography uh, very well. So, but it's still a pretty good product. And the idea is, especially here, if you can do this, if you're making these maps, you could then adjust the lines. You could see features such as land use or topography, and if you know why you think the soils are where they are, you could use that to improve the line work. And the la here is an example uh, of soil web from the same group, and here what they do when you click on it, you get all this information, and I mentioned the compound map units. Here's one where the name of the map unit is Shenango Gravelly Loan. That's a, that's a soil series. But they mention the possible inclusions of different soils that you might find in there. So here's my point. I put, in, I put an X here. So this whole map unit is mapped as having one, uh, one soil type. And, um, but in fact, you might go to a specific spot in there, and they're telling you these are some of the other things you might find. Uh, this is an alluvial soil, then instead of these gravel, gravelly soils, this is a sort of silty, wetter alluvial soil as opposed to it. So you might find these different things. Um, I like to show this area because there's, is, 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 they, they also made a, you can see there's a misregistration here and this, this unit should be over here. 
but this is just something I can't resist telling you about, even though it's pretty specialized. You notice there's a waterfall here. There's a waterfall, and here's an outlet channel. But where is the stream coming into the waterfall? Here's, you, see, you, see the, you see that waterfall there, an abandoned waterfall. It's dry. There's a very sh so here we have a hillside, but here we have this very sharp drop and an outlet channel that's coming along here. Where is the stream that's making that waterfall? Subsurface? No. Good, good, that's an, uh, that is an idea, but it's not so. This is all, this is not a limestone terrain. This is acid, uh, acid rocks terrain. It's irrigating orchards somewhere else. <laughs> no. It's a little bit tricky question. It's melted. It's gone back to the North Pole. At a certain point, the ice, the ice of the glacier was here. The glacier was here, and at a certain point, the glacier was here, and the stream, as it's melting from the glacier, came here and, and was cut all the way back this channel. So this is a relic of the Ice Age. And this is aban it's abandoned because when the ice then finally melted, there's, you know, the source was, the ice was right up against the side of the hill. And there's a, it's hard to see, but you can see how there's a flat area here where the stream was flowing, and then it kept cutting back this channel. So you have to know the ice was there. So everything was caused by the ice, also around here. So that's just a little point. You can forget about that if you're not interested in glacial geology. It's a pretty interesting place. And the last I just want to show, he's also done it, so you can put it on, on Google Earth and view it. This is extremely good. Google Earth's a wonderful thing because here, you can use this to communicate very clearly with uh, your users. OK, let's keep moving here. OK, let's talk about this. So that's the status, uh, some of the status of the, of, the, of the maps, the coverages you have. Georeference points, we have quite a few. Uh, the, the United States makes their data completely available. It's, therefore, it's used by a lot of people. Uh, they have a, so, and these are, these are very detailed records. Uh, they have many from the United States, but they've also taken some from other places. Uh, there's a European database, and right here at ISRIC, and if you want to know more about it, uh, Niels is on top of this. Niels is, is this, are these numbers still about right? 11,000 non-harmonized and 1,125 harmonized? Depends on how you define harmonized. Well, I asked you for these numbers when I first wrote this paper. harmonized to the FAO classification system. That's what the harmonized implies. So are no, these about the right numbers? 20,000, no. 20, So I should update this. Uh, and then the Africa Soils Profile Database with Johan is working on. And here's the picture from their web page of, of where these profiles are taken from. This is a really interesting project. Uh, it, it, it really illustrates, I think, a lot of the pitfalls of, this, of all this work in that, that he can tell you horror stories. You, you can just, just turn your hair white, <laughs> like his hair. <laughs> no, where is the location really? What methods were really used? Uh, uh, lot, and you see, incon you see obvious inconsistencies, but you're wondering, uh, am I being too subjective about it, or is this real an inconsistency? So it's, it's rescuing these is like a major problem. I'm, I keep exceeding my storage. So anyway. Uh, the message is uh, be very appreciative when you get this data, but also be somewhat uh, not suspicious of this because it's very well documented. But when you just get point data from somewhere, you really have to be very critical about what you have. Okay, I just have a couple, just a reference, just two things I could find on the dynamic properties. There is an international soil moisture network that shows you all the soil moisture sensors, so time series of soil moisture sensors. And I mentioned the satellite that's going up now, so there'll be more of this. Uh, and there's a soil climate analysis network also of uh, sensors, but that's, I think, only in the USA. OK, so we're getting towards the end. I want to talk about, let's talk about the, the state or the status of it, I should say. One thing is that more inf much more information is digital now. So when we talk about over 10 or 11 years ago, much more has been made digital, just like everything else. Uh, ESB, the European uh, Soil Bureau. One thing they've done very nicely is they've made scans of all of ISRIC's collection of paper maps. So at least these are scanned and preserved 
They're all available online. You can get a DVD for either free or almost, almost no cost. They also have these soil atlases I wanted to show. This is, this is a really nice product. Uh, these, these are not, uh, this is not a GIS product, but it's really, really excellent explanations, and they have them in different places. You can, uh, down, these are available as, as PDFs. They're quite big PDFs, but they're available, and they'll be glad to send you one, I'm sure. I like that. Um, access is much improved because of the, just the internet being much better. If people, people are getting more and more uh, cognizant of metadata, of how the importance of metadata. So in general, I find that I, I can understand data better when I get it. Uh, the geodesic incompatibility is now really not a problem at all. The only problem is just making sure that you know what your original map was. Once you know that, transforming it and making it compatible with other coverages is, is very simple. Uh, you have to take care in it, but there's this uh, GDAL project that has all these projections, so that's all right. Uh, much, more is publicly, much more is publicly available. So let's talk about what I think the trends are going to be. Well, uh, <laughs> these are trends in technology that don't have anything, the first two don't have anything specific to do well, this one has nothing to do with soils in general. But the second one does. We are getting these instruments now, these, uh, the high-resolution remote sensors, in other words, spectrometers on airplanes, really high, the hyperspectral data. Field sensors are one of the major things that are happening now. So now many farmers have on-the-go sensors on their tractors that are scanning the whole field. Uh, with varying degrees of precision, but you're now getting things on a resol field resolution of maybe seven by seven meters, that kind of thing. Now, whether we can get that into common databases is another question. There's more emphasis on spatial data infrastructures to allow soils data to be served with others, and I'll show an example of the European portal in a minute. Similarly, there are better metadata standards. The metadata standards are there, I should just say, and there are many tools to work with them. So if people take the time to do the metadata, they have a way to do that. That's going to be a trend. And then I said I'd say something about disaggregation, so I'm going to. Uh, this will be a trend that will take these polygon maps and with the, mm, some knowledge about where the components in those polygons might be, we can do some disaggregation. And there are quite a few interesting papers on that. I just will show one example from uh, Yang Lin, a colleague in, uh, who's at, uh, in Beijing at the Chinese Academy of Sciences. This was an original soil map from an area in New Brunswick in Canada. And she, uh, she, did, she just made it, she gridded it because she's going to now predicting per grid cell. Has to be some discretization. Originally, so this is what I would call, let's call it the fake grid, what I was saying before, right? By finding the typical landscape positions and environmental conditions behind these soils and then applying it to the original map, she get a much finer map with the exact same legend. So it's the same soils, the same soil types, but now a much more detailed picture of where they actually occur. And, and you see uh, quite some, some little differences here. Like for example, if you look here, this was all in this unit, but here, they were able to find that, in fact, there were two different soils here uh, that at the original mapping scale they couldn't show because they had a restriction on the side of things they could show or maybe they couldn't find it. So now you are coming down to a much more detailed scale with the same, you haven't done anything except find a typical position. Well, thank you, I, I like this very much. Of course, you could also do this on the, let's say, the attribute data with profiles and then predict in the same way, desaggregate the properties yeah. directly instead of just the soil. Yeah, in this case, yeah, in this case, because the, the properties here, though, I, I'm not sure that would work here because the properties are linked to the soil types. So you first have to know where the soil type is before you can do the property. Yeah, yeah I mean, a link to the, okay, yeah, all right. Yeah. But, uh, if you had points, there's another approach of oh, disaggregation I mean, that's used. Use the mapping units, so yeah. I, I, yeah. explicitly use the polygon and not the points. Right. Right. So we're getting something for nothing here, which is, which is pretty good. Uh, just wanted to mention the Geodata portal. Inspire is an example. This is meant to give all the information of Europe all in one place. It's 
I don't find it too easy to navigate, but the, this is a directive from the European Union, and the soils data then becomes part of this. Okay, so what are some, some trends in the next five years in what I might call a social, social sense? Well, Tom and I, we agree on certain things, and uh, definitely these are two of them. One is this idea that the, the trend to reproducible research is growing. And what I mean by that is that when someone produces the research, they have to provide the data and the scripts that got the results so that others can reproduce that research directly and possibly build on it. So you don't trust the author, that the author makes a nice paper, but you don't really trust the author, or it's not that you don't trust the author, but you yourself can reproduce that and apply it to your own. It's very frustrating when you're trying to do research and you read a nice paper, and when you try to implement it, you realize there are missing steps. There are a lot of things that are kind of, well, how did they actually do that anyway? But with reproducible research, it has to be so that another person can reproduce it. Uh, publishing our scripts is a good example here. Then there's a more movement to open source software, Creative Commons licenses that will allow you to reuse and mash up people's works. The data being published, I have some data sets that I developed with students that we've deposited in a data repository in the three technical universities of the Netherlands. So Twente, Delft, and uh, Eindhoven have together a 3TU data center where you can deposit a data set, get a DOI for it, get academic credit for it, and it's now and it's got to be documented sufficiently that anyone can now use this. So we have some soils data from, from Mozambique we, we put there. And that would mean that's going to be, I think, socially this will become more and more acceptable. In other words, in the academic world they'll say, well, you have to put your data in fact, some, some funding agency even, even say you have to put your data where other people can get them. Now in soils specifically, we have a couple of, we hope we're getting more international coordination. What's happened in the past is ISRIC as, a global, as the global world data center has built up nice collaborative relations with other providers but on more an individual or ad hoc basis and on a trust basis. And what's now happening is, uh, especially which I'll mention in a moment, the Global Soil Partnership, which is sponsored by the FAO, the idea is to make this now a, a more of a participatory pro process. And we hope that the different institutes will feel they have a stake in this and will get more collaboration. It's often very difficult to get soils information from other countries. Global Soil Maps, another story, but I put it up here just to make people happy when I was presenting this at that other meeting. Okay, so demand. Hey, let's look at the positive side of here. We really hope, I think that this is the year of soils, but I've seen so much activity over the last number of years. Articles in the popular press. I think the, the, the concept that soils are important for the future, and in many ways, I think has really reached the popular consciousness. So I, I think that's a positive thing, and I think we're gonna get more demand. We have to focus that. The emphasis is going to be on soil functions. Uh, so if you're providing soils data, that's fine, but most people will want functions. What is the soil really doing on the landscape? Is it purifying water? Is it, store, is it sequestering carbon? Is it exchanging gases? You know, what's it actually doing on the landscape? And the modelers are busy at that. There's a lot of emphasis on soil health and so forth, um, and that's becoming and finally, the emphasis on monitoring, because for years and years we've worried about this, and you heard about land degradation from Khadr, but the idea that we really want to know, really what is the status of the world's soils and which way are they going, and it's really unclear. And it's a very difficult thing to do, but I think that's a trend in demand. How we satisfy that demand is another question. I just wanted to mention the Global Soil Partnership. This has been driving me crazy. I've been writing an implementation plan for this Pillar 4. The idea is that the different countries will all commit to making consistent soil data available for at a global scale. So we'll see how that happens. But the nice thing about this Global Soil Partnership, you see everyone shaking hands, and uh, the idea is that it's supposed to be a real partnership, and we hope the FAO can get people to agree. All right. Sorry, I'm going over a little over time, but now we get to the thing. Three slides on how you can participate, give you some motivation. Well, 
If you're a user of soil geographic information, which I guess you all are or you wouldn't be here, right? Uh, okay, go out and look for the data you need and uh, check when you get the data, have I got the data I need? Is it properly documented? Do, do, I, do I understand it? Uh, so first say, well, could I figure out what's going on here? They, I, I need data on a certain province in a certain country and, and I can find it, I can't find it, what's going on? Do some reality checks on the data. That is some area you probably know something about. Look at the internal consistency of the data set. Uh, is there something, something if you just look at the, at the characteristics, does something look wrong? Does it look like, for example, all the, all the pH values are only at, uh, at, at single units? What, what's going on here? Uh, and external consistency with other coverages. So I showed you some examples where if we look at the soil distribution on the digital elevation model, we might see some inconsistencies. So we say, well, if the digital elevation model is, is geometrically correct, there's something wrong with the soil coverage. But, so try to do some checks. And the most important thing is if something is wrong, go back and complain to the data provider. Let them know that you're not satisfied with the product. You, you have to put pressure on them to give a better product. And don't, get, don't be put off by any excuses. I mean, if, if, you, know, if you can't understand, if, if, they, if there's a, a pH value and they don't tell you, was it measured in water, in KCL, what the ratio was, it's very hard to do anything with it, so go back and ask. If they don't know, you say, well, you'd better find out. So what I'm trying to say is here, be a demanding consumer. So if you're a consumer of soils data, be, be, be demanding. If you don't understand something about soil grid, you write Tom and say, Tom, I don't get this. You didn't explain it. Now, I mean, but uh, I, I, not picking on Tom, because in fact, he goes out of his way to think about these things beforehand, but, but be a good consumer. Now, if you're at a home institute and you're involved in soils data, uh, take part in getting the data organized and, 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 and put, put this out. Uh, try to get involved in, in, with soil grids and contributing there or in the Global Soil Partnership. So try to look for examples where you can, can share your data or collaborate. I talked about business models at the, at the beginning, and I, I think that you can make a case, I hope you can make a case at your home institute, that the better business model is actually to give free and complete access to good quality, properly documented data. Give it away. Give it away. You say, what? I've got this valuable resource. Why am I giving it away? First off, it's probably what you're legally required to do anyway, uh, so that when you, uh, when you go back to the legislature or whoever's funding you, you can say, look, we're doing our job. That's one. Second, you get a good reputation of the institute in the general world, and that should bring lots of opportunities in consulting or custom data. Uh, they have the data. They say, oh, I love your data. It's well explained, but I don't know how to convert this to a certain soil function or I don't know how to then set, use this data to set up a monitoring system, you say, ah, oh, well, we can do that. We're happy to do that. Let's write a project. So that's just my, my take. You probably end up with a, a much more money coming to your institute if you do it this way. But anyway, that's for you to talk about with your management. As a citizen, if you're just not in any of those situations, you might feel motivated to look for opportunities for crowdsourcing. And, uh, there's a geo wiki that allows you to go around and, and, and look at maps and make a little, so if you're, if you're bored at night rather than watching television, you can do this. Uh, an example that Tom has set up is this World Soil Profiles, but there are other opportunities to, to contribute and say, well, just as an individual, I mean, there's nothing stopping me from going out here in the woods, making a soil profile and sending it to Tom, right? I guess maybe it might be illegal, but I don't know about that. That's right. um, so, oh, there we go. So wait, I, that's, I, I put this Creative Commons on. I don't know if I got the right one, Tom. We'll see. Um, so uh, that's all I have to say, and we can just see your questions.